Mr. Chairman, dear colleagues, I'm uh, very glad to share this talk with you. The topic is uh, HLA and non-HLA antibodies in pediatric transplantation, and I have no disclosures. The content will be why and how often antibodies develop, what are the subtypes of antibodies and predictive thresholds of this level, what is the clinical relevance of antibodies, how often should be monitored, what are the modalities of desensitization and what level of basic immune suppression is protective against the development of antibodies in the low-risk patients. Today, uh, donor-specific antibodies are one of the major biological uh, factors and parameters which are uh, tested before, at the time, and then post-transplant and long-term follow-up in terms to optimizing the outcome and also the management. Donor-specific antibodies uh, harm the graft in three different ways. One is direct. Two are indirect, and this indirect can be divided into complement binding and non-complement binding. As you can see, uh, those who use complement finally provoke that uh, membrane attack complex uh, is uh, giving the cell lysis. In non-complement binding DSAs, they, they use certain cells which then uh, degranulate the lytic enzymes and make a tissue injury. This should be regarded that um, often there is a clear clinical trigger we can diagnose, which then is translated into ongoing chronic growth dysfunction, but pretty often we don't see this uh, clear uh, clinical trigger, there is an indolent, uh, in clinical terms, injury of the graft, which then is translated to slower, however, ongoing graft dysfunction. In kidney, often it is seen in a biopsy only, or in a biopsy accompanied by higher uh, MFI of donor-specific antibodies. In biopsy, we see transplant glomerulopathy, and uh, if it's uh, antibody-mediated rejection paratubular capillaritis, and depending what uh, type of the antibodies is working against the, the graft, we see or not see uh, C4D uh, in, in, in the biopsy. What is important is the binding complementability. So, we have to uh, test if these DSAs we, we see are binding complement, so means it they are C1Q positive. As an idea, the same uh, pathomechanism is in the liver graft, so uh, donor-specific antibodies also work in two different ways, binding and uh, not binding complement, and the uh, final clinical result is a chronic antibody-mediated rejection or inflammation and fibrosis as a, one of the patterns of chronic injury. Non-HLA antibodies are formed against several uh, antigens. However, in transplant setting, we are focused on three of them. One is MHC class 1 related chain A, so MICAR. Second is angiotensin 2 type 1 receptor and endothelin 1 type A receptor. These uh, antigens are present in a different part of the graft, uh, in vascular or not vascular, also in uh, epithelial cells. So there is a variety of places where the damage can occur. The incidence of de novo and uh, uh, de, de novo DSAs and non-HLA antibodies is very variable, and the reports are very different. This dispersion of the reported incidence is related to several factors, including methodology of detection, accepted threshold cutoff of the positive results, also timing of evaluation after transplantation, because the later is the test, the 
there is more uh, chance that we will discover uh, DSAs. And the most important is the clinical background at evaluation because prospective screening gives completely different results versus for course testing means in patients who are in trouble. If it's prospective, uh, for years the number repeats that the uh, average incidence of HLA and non-HLA antibodies is about 22-25%. This number was published a couple of years ago by uh, people from uh, UCLA, but it will repeat in a, in a more recent report. So prospective screening gives more or less similar numbers. This is an example of the small study we did showing that with time the incidence of DSA regularly was increased and about the two years post-transplant it was about 21%. This is the retrospective study from Heidelberg showing uh, this phenomenon that when you check the patients who are in trouble, the incidence of the antibodies you discover is much higher. Here we see that patients who did not show rejection in a biopsy, in, among them the, the incidence was about 21. However, patients having T-cell rejection presented in one-third the antibodies and having antibody-mediated rejection beyond 70%. So the more is uh, clinically relevant trouble, the bigger is the chance that we discover antibodies in the patients. The study uh, bring also a very important message that patients who are actively generating one type of antibodies often develop in parallel the other types of antibodies. There is some kind of synergistic effect between HLA and non-HLA antibodies as well as between the subtype of non-HLA antibodies. So in clinical practice, if we have patients uh, who is identified as, as, as actively producing one type and have some clinical troubles, we should also screen him for another type of antibodies and in, in, in most cases we will be able to show it. In liver, the numbers up to five years are pretty similar, so prospective screening for DSAs gives information that about 20% of the patients uh, present these uh, DSAs. However, this is interesting when we extend the follow-up up to 20 years and the, the, the more patients every year regularly produce DSA, so at the end the numbers beyond year uh, 16, 17 post-transplant is higher than 60%. So it's regular trends which is uh, starting about 10 years post-transplant and goes up. Just to remind you, we have uh, for DSA2 uh, class 1 and class 2 antibodies, and these of class 1 are against the, an the, the antigens ABC, Pres the location of epitopes is alpha chain, and expression is on, on all nucleated cells. Class 2, Antigens are the other QDP uh, located uh, on alpha and beta chains and the uh, expression is on the antigen presenting cells. Class 1 uh, gives often positive T-cell crossmatch which doesn't allow uh, to transplant the patient. This class 2 uh, is uh, produced the, the, the positive crossmatch against T-cells which in some circumstances is permissible for qualification to transplant. Uh, class 1 is uh, appearing sooner. The subclasses of IgG is G1, G3. They strongly bind complement. And in contrary, class 2 come later. The, the subclasses of IgG is G2, G4, and they weakly or not at all uh, bind the complement. And clinical phenotype with, associated with class 1 is an acute, early, occurring, rapidly progressive uh, rejection uh, with positive tests uh, against the deposit of C42. However, this is more responsive to therapy. And here, on contrary, this is chronic, subclinical, 
appearing later and going slowly, uh, a rejection with negative, often, deposits of C4D. However, it is less responsive to the therapy. Here is uh, the, the, the example showing that patient having uh, much uh, critical uh, troubles uh, produce more IgG3, so class, class one uh, uh, antibodies. Why do they develop? There are certain factors which are related to donor, recipient, direct procedure, and long-term follow-up. For donor-related factors, there is a mild uh, genetic predisposition uh, in, which is associated with increased expression of endothelial MIC antigens, which stimulate production of the specific antibodies. In recipients, of course, the, the, the factor will be preformed antibodies from the past, from the previous graft, or, or maybe blood transfusion. But also there is uh, uh, the regulation of the uh, T follicular helper cells, which cause the excess of autoreactive B cells clones. And this favors hyperactive tumoral immunological activity. Direct procedure related factors are very clear. This is mismatch, mismatch of HLA, epitope, applet. And uh, this is even more important in retransplantation with mismatch. But also the ischemia reperfusion injury, because uh, this is associated with uh, uh, increased inflammation and apoptosis, which induces formation, formation of new antigens. And these new antigens stimulate tumoral immunological response. For long-term factors, of course, inadequate suboptimal immune suppression. We can, we doctors can make a mistake and uh, prescribe uh, suboptimal immune suppression, but more often the uh, immune suppression is well prescribed, but it is not followed. So non-adherence in patients is one of the major factors which increases the risk of the production of antibodies. And the last one will be the removal of the uh, primary loss kidney graft in patients who was positive in terms of production of DSAs. And this removal uh, will be associated with uh, increase of uh, the concentration MFI uh, of antibodies in, in, the, in the circulation because there is no more a filter, which is the, the graft, which normally catches these uh, antibodies and removal is associated with uh, a substantial increase of the numbers and MFI of antibodies in the circulation. The current methodology of matching is more uh, detailed than it was a couple of decades ago. Now we type not only antigens, but also epitopes, triplets, applets, and apparently uh, the mismatch in applets brings the high risk of production of DSAs. This is the case for some of them, uh, especially like DQ molecule, and the hazard ratio is significant. The same is in liver, because the mismatch in DR and plus DQ, the applets, is associated in liver patients also with higher production of donor-specific antibodies. There is ongoing discussion what the threshold of MI5, which is uh, mean fluorescent intensity, which is the, the surrogate marker of, of the concentration of, of the uh, antibodies, which, is, which threshold of this parameter is clinically relevant. Classically, uh, it, it, it was shown that up to 5,000, it is weak, between 5,000 and 10,000 is moderate because it begins to be associated with uh, the rejection and beyond 10,000 is, is uh, strong and risky because these patients present antibody-mediated rejection in majority. However, <clears throat> if we now have uh, another more detailed parameter, which is donor-derived cell-free DNA level, which is associated with the uh, with rejection 
One can show that already about 2,500, it begins to grow and patients having the DSA MFI beyond 2,500 present high level of uh, DD cell-free DNA. So we have to be careful, it means, with the patients uh, producing antibody and showing MF5 about 2,500 already. Then the story goes that uh, the number of uh, different DNDSA per patients are regarded as uh, these numbers as a risk factors. The more different DSAs patient presents, uh, the allograft survival will be inferior. There are some even uh, proposals to support calculators which combine the points uh, basing on uh, each type of DSA and MF5, and the higher is the score, the higher is the risk of, of antibody-mediated rejection. Then the evolution of uh, the MFI of uh, uh, DNDSA is important because patients who maintain the high MFI have the inferior outcome in terms of the allograft survival, while the patient in whom spontaneously or under treatment the, the MFI decreases do better. Very important is binding of complement because uh, this type of uh, antibody is uh, associated with inferior outcomes of patient having high MFI, which is uh, in this uh, particular uh, report be beyond 15,000 and uh, binding complement, the, the difference in, in graph survival is uh, striking. This is also confirmed by meta-analysis showing that binding complement is an important risk factor uh, for rejection and, and further growth dysfunction. This is very nice uh, pediatric kidney study from US showing that the persistence of the de, de novo DSA binding complement is related to, to, to the graft loss, while the patient in whom these uh, antibodies disappeared over time on the treatment, uh, they did not uh, lose the graft uh, in long term, and therefore the risk factor hazard ratio uh, of this uh, binding complement DNDSA is very striking. So this is important message from this study. In liver, uh, also the mismatch of the antigens is associated with uh, the higher incidence of the novo DSA, and this is translated into higher risk of the acute rejection. However, in long-term follow-up, there are data showing that it is not related to the difference in, in graph survival, which is similar, as you can see here, uh, in patients who were positive and negative in terms of DSA. However, there is also a message showing that patients who are positive, uh, I mean, producing DSA class 2, uh, when they are checked long term with repeated biopsies and also the uh, elastography stiffness, uh, stiffness evaluation, there is a correlation between fibrosis at long term and the uh, presence of uh, class 2 DSAs in these patients. Uh, this is confirmed in a couple of studies. Here again, the message that the patient who are DSA positive at long term present uh, abnormal graph histology, advanced fibrosis or rejection over time in long term follow up. Interesting setting is combined liver kidney transplantation, but we expect that the, the, the liver will be protecting kidney and here the message uh, as here you can see that even in patient producing a very high uh, level uh, of antibodies the outcome of both kidney and liver graft is not inferior uh, comparing to patient who produce less uh, amount of antibodies however there are also some more careful data 
Here we see that patient uh, after combined kidney liver transplantation, uh, which produ who produced the class two DSAs, uh, there was a, a significant risk of liver rejection while not renal rejection. So seems like these antibodies were harmful to the liver graft and the protection uh, was still maintained over the kidney. Now about the association between maintenance immune suppression and DSAs, the, the, the major simple well-known uh, risk factor is non-compliance or not adherence. So patients who don't follow uh, the instruction how to take a drug are at uh, highest risk. This is the case in different settings. This is the very interesting study as this is the longest ever published follow-up of patients treated with TWIST protocol, which means renal patients with very early steroid withdrawal, a withdrawal at five days post-transplant. And uh, after 10 years, it was shown that uh, the incidence of DSA, again, it was about 22%. So you see that number the incident in prospective manner checked uh, repeats about 20 to 25 percent and but those who produced these antibodies and lost the graph were not adherent it was proven here is interesting uh, a comparison or of or, uh, evaluation of the level of trough level of tacrolimus which is regarded as a main maintenance drug which should protect against the production of DSAs and uh, it was shown that the level five is the threshold be below which patient more actively produce donor specific antibodies. Here is even more specifically shown that this threshold is different for patient who present bigger mismatch of HLA. So the bigger is mismatch of, uh, uh, of uh, HLA, the more important for graft survival is to maintain tacrolimus trough level beyond five nanogram per mil. This is study from adults uh, uh, from Japan, but showing specific population only living related transplant on low risk patients. And uh, then they compared uh, the trough level of tacrolimus between the group which was DN, DN, DSA negative and positive, and the patient who were negative, the, the, the patients were negative, the average was about five, while here uh, positive recipients showed the, the, the average level of trough concentration about close to four. So, so the, the message repeats that it should be higher than five. In some settings, it was shown that it should be even higher. This is also adult study in patients off steroids. So again, low immunological risk, patient steroid free, in whom the trough level beyond seven was protective against the production of the novo DSAs. Also another factor, which is intra-individual tacrolimus variability uh, of, the, of the C0, of trough level, was shown to be important to develop uh, donor-specific antibodies. One can say this variability may be associated with non-adherence, but also uh, there are some other factors which induce this variability. They are some kind of uh, um, correlation with genetic profile and age. In younger children, it is more frequent. Anyway, if it's uh, high, the variability, renal patients were shown to produce more actively donor-specific antibodies. In our center, we have also uh, evaluated this, and we showed that, again, patients who were DNA, uh, DNDSA negative have higher tacrolimus concentration, which here was uh, about 7.9, while positive were 7.9. And we didn't find this, uh, this uh, importance of the uh, variation of the C0. However, it was found in another setting in liver patients 
it is similar uh, correlation showing that liver patients presenting high variability uh, produce more uh, significantly the donor uh, the D and DSAs. Also, the recommendation coming from, from big centers in terms of how to proceed when you have a patient who is actively producing DSA, especially this binding complement, is suggest that after treating acute rejection, you should increase tacrolimus to the trough level between 7 and 10 and maintain this for a couple of months in terms of preventing uh, of uh, the rebound. Of course, this is one of the m of many other uh, uh, part of this management we will be discussing the sensitization part of this talk. However, this range beyond seven is repeating in some setting as, a, as protective. In liver patients, it was shown that if you don't use immune suppression based on calcineurin inhibitor or you withdraw it because of nephrotoxicity, the risk of the producing uh, DSAs is increasing significantly. And uh, the other types of the regimens, which are on the other hand protective of, to the kidneys because they are not nephrotoxic, in terms of protection against production of the novo DSAs are not working well. So this is the message very important because many centers switch patients from tacrolimus to other uh, type of immune suppression, mTOR inhibitors, MPA and so on, you may expect that some of your patients will produce DN DSAs. Now about non-HLA uh, antibodies, this is uh, MICA antigens, which were shown to be important for the outcome uh, in, in transplantation many years ago. And also there was a message that preformed anti-MICA antibodies increased the uh, <coughs> rejection rate and uh, this rejection appear early post-transplant. So screening patient before transplantation is also important if you find MICA, you can expect troubles early. Now the other uh, antibodies, this is angiotensin 2 type 1 type 1 receptor antibodies, which were discovered many years ago that Dushka Dragoon was the one of the first person who described it and showed that the presence of these antibodies, even in patients who were negative in terms of DSAs, is important factor showing inferior renal graft survival. It was confirmed by other studies. This is a, a pediatric study from Heidelberg showing that these antibodies are also important in children, inferior graft outcome. However, they showed that the combination of these antibodies with uh, donor-specific antibodies, anti-HLA, was most striking at this patient did uh, had the, the the lowest outcomes how do they work it was shown that uh, the presence of these antibodies which is clinically uh, associated with the presence of acute rejection is also associated with uh, overproduction of several pro-inflammatory cytokines among these cytokines, there were cytokines which TNF alpha or interference, which were which are involved in, in acute rejection, but also others, the certain interleukins. The same is uh, with uh, the same story repeats with endothelin type A receptor antibodies. Uh, there is a correlation between the higher level or percentage of those and acute rejection, and it is also translated with uh, increased concentration of uh, certain interleukins. So the message coming uh, from this uh, Heidelberg study, which was shown very early in this talk, is that you should combine uh, the, the screening of HLA and non-HLA antibodies in the patient who is in trouble Therefore, you can find uh, very clearly that the specificity and sensitivity 
of this combined evaluation of HLA, non-HLA antibodies identifies the patient at the highest risk. How about liver pediatric patients and this type of antibodies, uh, angiotensin 2 type 1 receptor? Interestingly, uh, the highest uh, concentration and incidence of this antibody was seen in patients who are young. So it is a little bit on contrary than DSAs when the older patients produce or are shown to have a higher incidence and levels of antibodies. For this type of antibodies, the young age is associated with higher incidence and concentration of these antibodies. However, even though it was correlated with late growth dysfunction, the, the, the significant factor was coincidence, uh, so in parallel presence of these antibodies with any type of uh, anti-HLA and DSAs. So combination, co combination of those was giving the inferior outcome. It was similar like it was in renal patients in, from Heidelberg study showing the more different antibodies the patient has, the lower is the, uh, the outcome in terms of uh, graph survival. If we have patients who are sensitized, we have to remove these antibodies and block them. One of the simple methodology how to uh, transplant sensitized patient is try to much better. So seeking for ideal, ideal uh, uh, kidney is one of the ways which of course can extend the waiting time and sometimes it's uh, not acceptable anymore if it's too long. The second very important thing is prospective monitoring. So when we stratify pre-transplant risk uh, of, the, of this particular patient and transplantation, the, the higher is the risk stratified before transplantation, the more frequent should be prospective testing. So in patients who are identified as high risk, it should be every three months in the first year. In any case of doubts, patients should have a biopsy and this biopsy should be repeated if, uh, in prospective manner also if the patient pre presented a rejection in the first biopsy. When we want to desensitize the patient, of course, we can try to do it before transplantation or at the time of transplantation. But the major problem is that there is a rebound. So even if we are able to remove and then give the drug, which is aimed to block the generation of new ones, uh, most of the patient will come back with new DSAs. So ongoing surveillance is, is mandatory. To remove the antibodies, uh, we can use plasma phrases uh, followed by IVIG given in high doses, which is two grams per kilo. It was proven that uh, four consecutive uh, sessions of plasma phrases is enough because beyond fourth, the efficacy of removing of certain pool of the antibodies is, is already not significant. And uh, for years, there were um, suggestions and then tests and reports coming, for instance, from, from Stanford with uh, Dr. Jordan showing that uh, use of uh, IVIG and rituximab is able to uh, remove and block uh, the production of de novo uh, in a manner that it allows to, to transplant the patient. This recommendation came to the practice, and this is again this uh, nice presentation from US uh, multicenter studies with uh, this a recommendation IVIG, then rituximab, then plasma phrases. Here is bortezomib, which is uh, the final treatment for plasma, uh, plasmatic cells, it, it was mentioned. Uh, it should be also mentioned that desensitization is also used in liver transplantation by some centers. This is the survey from Japan showing that every 
type of combining things like uh, IVIG, rituximab, and even plasmapheresis and IVIG, rituximab was used in some centers. Uh, in, it was aimed to, of course, to remove and block the presence, uh, the production of class 1 and class 2 DSAs. There are some uh, more, let's say, new uh, uh, managements uh, described. One is associated with giving of clazacizumab. This is monoclonal antibody against interleukin-6. And interleukin-6 was shown that uh, it is activated, uh, it is associated with activation of uh, T cells, B cells, and plasma cells producing antibodies. So blocking of uh, interleukin-6 with this drug can decrease the ability of these cells to produce antibodies, and it was proven in adult clinical trial. Recent striking uh, drug is imlifidase. This is the antibody cleaving enzyme giving in one shot in patient who is uh, who pro who shows the positive cross match, and after four hours this cross match becomes negative because the antibodies which were in charge for positive results were cleaved but by, by, by this drug. So there were two trials, one in Sweden, one in the US, in the adults, uh, showing using of this uh, regimen uh, when the drug was given uh, just before the transplantation. However, it should be mentioned that then patients need very severe immune suppression, including several biologic drugs like uh, thymoglobin, uh, this is horse ITG, and or alemtuzumab and rituximab and even though the uh, results at six months were uh, favorable in terms of maintaining grafts at long term uh, it was shown that even with such a heavy immune suppression the incidence of antibody mediated rejection was 38 percent and most episodes occurred early within the first month post transplant of course it could be reversed with uh, certain treatment, but uh, this kind of uh, massive immune suppression, of course, is not suitable for everyone. So the risk must be balanced very carefully. Uh, who is suitable for such a protocol? Of course, for non-HLA antibodies, the desensitization techniques are similar, the removal and uh, blocking is uh, more or less the same idea and the only thing additional is the blocking of the antigens with uh, with drugs like sultans which hide the antigens against which the the antibody is produced this is an example uh, from heidelberg the patient who lost the first graph due to antibody mediated rejection it was proven that she, he, he had uh, antibodies against uh, this uh, receptor, 81R. Then he was desensitized using plasmapheresis, IVIG, then was retransplanted with living-related kidney from his mother, and uh, he was also given this uh, blocking of the angiotensin to and uh, it should be noted that even with such a sophisticated uh, manner of, of management, he lost the second draft within four years because of rebounds. So it shows that we can do it and have a success on short term. However, we still must face the rebound of production of certain antibodies or HLA or non-HLA and the final outcome may be not that good as we want to have. So in summary, the presence of the anti-HLA and specific non-HLA antibodies has negative impact on risk and of acute or chronic rejection, kidney graft survival and function. Therefore, prospective monitoring is an important approach. 
the presence of anti-HLA antibodies may have negative impact on risk of liver rejection or fibrosis, however, not necessarily on the liver graft survival. And there are different data in the stem conflicting as you know, a result. Nevertheless, protective effect of the liver over kidney in combined liver kidney transplant, the presence of de novo uh, DSAs may increase the risk of the liver rejection and may deteriorate the overall outcome. There are some several distinct subtypes and concentration threshold of specific antibodies which determine the clinical relevance and the risk of graft injury. However, in general, both anti-HLA specific and non-specific antibodies are of clinical relevance as they increase the risk of rejection or late graft loss of both. And the evidence is the clear in kidney while disputable in liver. Antigen epitope mismatch and inadequate immune suppression remain to be a major factors among the causes of the de novo DSA production. Antibody mediated rejection in anti-HLA antibodies negative patients suggests the presence of role of non-HLA non antibodies in kidney transplantation. Sensitized patients require desensitization, otherwise the pair chain organ donation is uh, a way to make kidney transplantation possible. Removal of antibodies and blocking of rebound generation are major steps of desensitization procedures. However, further mandatory exposure to severe biologic immune suppression, at least in kidney transplantation, makes this decision individually balanced as not every patient is suitable to do it. Thank you very much and we will be discuss this topic. Thank you.